welcome to you all for attending my talk, which is uh, officially entitled YUM2 Fast Orthogonal Open Multimethods in a Library. But this is actually the spirit of the talk. Open is good. So let's take a, a small case study. This is just a toy, but OK. Uh, we're building a, a library which, uh, which allows you to model an, abs an abstract syntax tree. And um, let's look how it uh, might look like. So I have elided all, all, everything which is cons, memory management, and so on. I have indented stuff uh, so that they could fit on a slide, so don't pick on me for that, please. So we have a, a root class, which is called node, which is an abstract class, which has a single virtual function called value, which returns the value of a node. So we're building an AST that allows us to represent and compute uh, arithmetic calculations. OK, uh, you know the drill. We have a, a structure or class member deri derived from node, which stores a value. And uh, the value function si re simply returns the stored value. We have the same for plus, which uh, contains references to two subnodes. And the value function returns the sum of the left and the right legs of the, of the expression. And the same with times, and this allows us to do to create small uh, a tree like this. So here we have an expression, which uh, is uh, three plus four between parentheses times two. And indeed, when we call a value function on this uh, on this expression tree, we get fourteen. Okay. Uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, feel free to ask questions absolutely any time. If you want to make a statement or start a debate, you can, but if it looks like it's taking too much time, we'll stop it and pick it up at the end of the talk, okay? So, okay, this is, this is very familiar. And, uh, and now uh, the problem we have is that we want to render the AST for example, using reverse Polish notation, notation, like you know, like on all Hewlett-Packard calculators. So um, I would like to to write a function or something that I could that would return a string, and the output of of this line would be two, three, four times plus, and then as before, equal fourteen. So how can I go about doing this? There are several options. You can add a virtual function in a class node. Um, this is actually what C++ supports best. Yes? So you probably mentioned that, but what does RPM stand for? What does? RPM stand for? Reverse Polish. Yeah, reverse Polish notation, uh, yes. Yeah. So you can use um, Scott Mayer's algorithm. Uh, a while ago, Scott Mayer wrote a, a paper in Dr. Dobbs where he argued that free functions should be used whenever possible. Yes? Oh, you're unborn. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, his point was that uh, free functions are good because they better promote reuse and encapsulation. And back then, he came up with a, with a sort of flow chart uh, that he used uh, to, to decide if a, mem a function was going to be a member function or a free function. It was actually in one of his books, uh, his effective C++ books. And if you, if you look at this flow chart, uh, it's you know, sort of all reasonable. If, uh, if you're writing an operator shift, uh, um, it has to be a non-member, uh, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, it's all reasonable except for this. If f needs to be virtual, make f a member function of c. 
Um, this is not wisdom, this is capitulation. Um, in that case, the reason why we are creating a member function is because it needs to be virtual. We need polymorphic behavior on, on a hierarchy of types. And, well, it would work. It's probably the, the more concise solution. So in, in the abstract node base class, we add a virtual function string, which is, which is pure, which is called 2RPN, and we implement it in, in the subclasses, right? And it will work, but, but now we have a problem. Any, any application that does not need to render expressions in RPN is going to get this function anyway, because that is the way C++ works. Behind virtual functions, you have virtual function tables, which are tables of pointers to function, and a constructor of, a, of, a, of, of the plus and times uh, classes initialize a pointer to that table. So it means that uh, if, if an application links our library, even if it's not interested in, in rendering expressions in RPN, it will still get that function, but it will not use it. And that's actually only the beginning of the trouble, because now that um, the various implementations of 2RPN, they use the class string. So it means that not only every application will pull in the, the three two RPN functions, it, it will also pull in string. Now, remember, this is a, a toy project. Um, I guess that any application will link a string in, but, but imagine that uh, instead we, ne next time we want to, for example, display a node uh, using Qt or, or Windows, and we want to return a different window depending on the type of the expressions. Now the problem is much more severe because we are linking Qt in any application, even though it doesn't want to, to, to display nodes in Windows, right? So this is an instance of a, a, a problem that someone uh, described very humorously. So the, the problem with OOP is that I want a banana, but I also get the gorilla which is holding the banana and the entire jungle with it, right? So you can see how those dependencies can cascade and cascade and you end up with a, a program that, that where it's, uh, I don't know, 50 case and, and still it's mostly that code, which is, it's not going to be used. Anyway, this is our solution number one. And people were, of course, dissatisfied with it and uh, they came up with several alternatives. One of them is the type switch. So here we code a function that uses dynamic cast. It takes a node and it tries to cast the node to a number. If it's a number, then we, we use the, the, the number pointer that we got here, extract the value and convert it to a string. If it's not a number, we try with, with a plus node and then a times node. And if we cannot find a match, we throw an exception. Okay, uh, so this has several problems. Uh, as the node hierarchy grows, it's, going, it's not going to be very efficient because dynamic cast is costly. We're going to examine all the options in sequence. It will not be efficient. But more importantly in my eyes, each time that you add a new sub, a new sub node, uh, a new node, node subclass, you have to, to modify this. You mustn't forget to modify this. Otherwise, at one point you'll have an exception. And this is even assuming that you can modify the type switch. If this function is in a library and uh, you cannot or you don't want to, to modify the source code, then, then you, you are sort of stuck. You'll have to create a new function which uh, tries the new subclasses and then calls this one, it's messy. Okay, so this is 
the second solution, the type switch. Or you can be into, into patterns. In that case, uh, you, can, you can write, you can use a visitor. Well, first you have to write it. So now the node class gets a subclass. Well, it could be, it could be a, a, a class at file scope. It doesn't matter. That contains a series of virtual functions which are overloaded on a concrete uh, node subtype. Okay, and then in node, you add a visit function which takes a visitor and which is going to call the right function depending on the node type. Now, there are all sorts of visitors, but uh, so, so sometimes the visitor will traverse the tree for you, but uh, I'm sticking to the most basic visitor here. Okay, let's go. Uh, now we must, uh, in, in a nodes, in the node subclasses, we need to implement uh, those visit functions. So visit, visitor, vis, override, accept this. Uh, by the way, each time I, when I wrote this example, I keep forgetting which one is called visit and which one is called accept. I got it wrong and I had to rename. Is it right? Is it, uh, am I using the right name or do I have them swapped? You think you're, it's right. Okay, now, then let's say that it's right. And now, equipped with my visitor, I can write the uh, uh, RPN visitor, which uh, overrides uh, the three accept functions and does, does whatever is needed. Oh, and then, oh yeah, I have to, to propagate a result. So here I have a, a string result variable in which I put the result of calling, uh, yeah, here, let's look at plus. So I call the visitor, uh, and then I fetch a result, which is a string, uh, which comes from visiting the left leg of uh, the tree. Then I do the same with, uh, yeah, it's not very natural because uh, the visitor, of course, doesn't know what, what type visitation should return. So it returns a void, so it's, uh, it's up to you to store the result elsewhere. Personally, I find this absolutely disgusting. Well, okay, now you can call it, you, to, to implement to string, you instantiate your visitor, you call node visit, and, and here it is. And uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, well, you could say it's a lot of work for the guy who implements the library, but once it's implemented, then it not, it's not so much work to use the visitor. Well, I disagree. You still have to, to subclass the visitor, to override functions, to juggle with the return values. And, and in fact, it, it's a lot of work and, and the result is, is, is not even very good. Because now, okay, the problem I had was that I wanted to add uh, a new polymorphic behavior to the node hierarchy. Now I can do it. Uh, now with the visitor, I can write uh, to Lisp, to infix, and so on. But the problem comes back when I want to add a new node subclass. If I'm the author of the visitor, I must go back and change the visitor to add new cases. And if I am not the author of the visitor, well, I'm sort of screwed. I must use patterns like dynamic visitor and, and, and it gets even clumsier, right? So at this point, I'd like to take, oh no, sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting one option. Another option is to use a function table. Here I, I define an alias for a pointer to a function that takes a node, returns a string, and I create a map that maps type index to functions of that type. So type index is a wrapper around type info that, makes, that, that can be used uh, as keys in maps, in order maps. And this is how I implement my 2RPN function. 
I access the map, I fetch the type ID of the node. It is this is going to return me the dynamic type ID, so maybe plus, and I fetch the right function, I call it. And at some point, I need to populate that, uh, that map, and I can do it, for example, with a, a static constructor, right? Um, the solution uh, has the usual drawbacks. Each time that I add a node subclass, I need to add entries in a table. But at least now I can do it, I can do it dynamically. I mean, now it's open. Uh, I don't need to modify any existing code if I decide to, to add uh, new, new node subclasses. Of course, I need to insert a new entry in the table, but at least this is extensible. Uh, there are still problems with this in that um, uh, inside the formatter functions, I need to, to do static casts. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite clumsy. Also, in the solution, I cannot take advantage of inheritance. I imagine that uh, I wanted to, um, to perform something on a node, whatever its exact subtype, right? I couldn't do it with this approach. It, this, this doesn't understand inheritance, right? But at least, but at least it's open. So at this point, let's take a little poll. Uh, you're going to tell me uh, which is your favorite approach, and you can vote only once. So who likes the um, add a virtual function in a node class? Who likes it? One, two, three. OK, three. Uh, who likes the type switch? Nobody. Uh, who likes the visitor? One. And who likes the function table? One. Well, it's kind of context dependent. Sorry? So, wait, 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 wait. wait. I, I, I record the vote. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, go ahead. By default, I would tend to use the virtual function because it's the simplest. And then probably the function table is my next choice because it's the most flexible. Okay, do I have to repeat? Yes, you could have done Yeah, so uh, the comment is uh, for the person who picked uh, the add a virtual function approach, uh, his motivation is that it's the simplest. And then, then his second option would be uh, the function table. Um, well, actually, this is interesting. Since there are not many of us, we're also going to take a poll on your second favorite option. So let's go again. Don't cheat. Huh? So who, for, for whom is the first option, add a virtual function, the second best choice? For David, the type switch, second best choice. A visitor, second best choice. Nobody. <laughs> it looks like everybody hates visitor, except one. And a function table, second best choice. Two. OK, right. And now we're going to take a, a final poll. Regardless of what you picked, are you happy with that solution? Who is happy with the solution he picked raises his hand. No. Oh, you are. <laughs> oh, gosh, I forgot to vote. So in my case, uh, in my case, of course, you got it. It's the function table first. And second would be, huh, it's really hard. Second would be virtual function depending on circumstances. OK. And I'm absolutely, absolutely unhappy with all of those choices, OK? Uh, questions, comments? Oh, one more thing. Do you often encounter that sort of situation? Who has encountered it before, at least once? Like, uh, oh, you too never encounter, encountered it. Oh, lucky you. No, but. Well, 
I work on Clang, so yeah. <laughs> the AST is uh, a play here. The, the, the AST manipulation is this. It's, uh, it's visitor, right? Right, it's visitor. Yeah. Well, in fact, yes. Okay. So, mm, yes. Change visitor by using a type of place. Uh, well, at, at least in the context of writing a compiler, uh, the, the, the class hierarchy is, is you know, still fairly closed, right? Uh, except that in, in Clang you support several languages. So does it happen that sometimes if you're... So what happens is they have a, a separate file that does a code generate and generates a switch. They have the tool that generates the switch for you. So the type hierarchy is closed. It's yeah. So yeah, so it means that uh, if you wanted to subclass Clang uh, to implement, you know, I don't know, your, a new variant of C++ for experimentation, you couldn't do it because all those editors so would not know your new nodes. You need to so, so, you, so what you do is you add a class, you modify one file that says, in one place, that says, okay, I have a new type, and then it, it generates all the code for the file. Okay. David? No, I was just going to say you have to modify there are, yes. like, there are like four or five places you need to update things to handle it. Uh huh. Okay, good. We're actually grappling with something which is called the expression problem. You can Google it, uh, and the expression problem is quite simple. Given a collection of, of behaviors, you want to add types to the existing behaviors. Now, uh, that is something that C++ does fairly well. Uh, you have a base class which defines a set of uh, virtual functions, probably pure, and uh, you have subclasses, and if you want to, and those virtual functions are what I call behavior, right? Um, and it is easy to, to add a new type to the system. You simply derive and override the appropriate virtual function. So, C++ and the traditional OOP languages do that well. The problem is when you want to add, to add behavior to existing types. And this is exactly what I was trying to do. I have a, um, I have a, a, a class hierarchy, node, uh, AST, and so on, and their job is to do AST, and then I need to render it. So, so it's, um, I want to add, to, to, to add new behavior to existing types. So that's called the, the expression problem. And you encounter it again and again in multi-layer architectures. Typically the three-layer architecture in which you have a, a domain layer which contains objects modeling the world and rules and so on. And uh, typically you want to persist those objects. So underneath you have a persistence layer but the persistent layers need to persist your objects differently on, depending on their dynamic type, right? So you're back to using function tables or switches and so on. And then typically above it, you have a presentation layer where you have a, an object like, I don't know, a criminal case, and you want to render it as a dialog box which allows you to add parties to the criminal case and so on. Um, and these are examples of what's called cross-cutting concerns. So normally the domain layer should just do domain layer, but uh, uh, we need to add behavior to it. And uh, I, I, I experienced that problem on a large scale when I was uh, working on the automation of the Belgian appeal court. Uh, so justice is complex, Belgium is complex, so the application was very complex. And we had class hierarchies which were like uh, at least 10, 10 to 20 layers deep, uh, inheritance uh, levels deep. And uh, we needed to, uh, to render, um, for example, a legal person in a way, a natural person in another way, but sometimes we needed to render just a person. For example, in the list box, we have a list uh, which, uh, which contains both legal and natural persons, and, uh, and then the user picks one, and then we need to, uh, to create a, a dialogue that allows you to edit the details and so on and so on. So, uh, 
in that case, well, uh, I, I took the um, virtual function approach, and we had, uh, and then we needed to use uh, that uh, domain layer in console applications, and uh, I wrote a generator that generated stubs for the functions that supported the UI. Well, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's uh, fairly disgusting, but it was actually, I agree, the, the simplest solution. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about my library, YUM2, and, and which, which brings a solution to the expression problem. So ex solutions to the expression problems, there are several types of um, solution, for example, open type switch or open pattern matching. Uh, in my case, what I, uh, what I implemented are open methods. So how do we use it? First, we need to include an include file URL yum 2 qhpp uh, Qt means that you get uh, cute names like declare, method, and so on. Uh, it's, if you include yum 2hpp then you get, you know, ugly uh, uh, capitalized macros like big yum 2 underscore big class and so on. So I, I prefer the cute, uh, the cute headers. So um, there's still a boring part to, to using methods. It's that you have to tell the system uh, about the class hierarchy. You have to register a class node, register a class plus, and say that it's derived from node, and so on. Uh, in the D language version of the library, there's no need to do that, because uh, the uh, runtime type information of the D language is, is, is a little richer. But once you've done that, it becomes easy. You Use a using, declara uh, using declaration to bring in the key, the word, the, the, the name virtual underscore. This is a, you should see it as a keyword. This is how we're going to declare virtual parameters. And here, I say declare method. Return type string, the name to RPN, and then the argument list between parentheses. So, you know, it's really like a function declaration. If you remove declare method and the commas, it's exactly the same, the same syntax. And here, in the parameter list, I say virtual underscore bracket const node reference. So this says that um, when I'm going to call to RPN, which is a free function, uh, it's going to select the right specialization among a certain set. So, and here I define the, the available specializations or overrides the terminal energy varies. Here I say define method string to RPN and here const number reference expression. No virtual here, right? And I give the code of uh, the body for the method. I do the same for plus and the same for times, right? This is the exact equivalent of the 2RPN virtual function from before, except that we, we've taken the virtual function and we moved it outside of the class. But when, when I call 2RPN, it's exactly the same thing that happens as with virtual functions. It gets a node reference, and then it looks at the dynamic type and depending on the dynamic type, it selects the most specific of the ride. Okay? This is, this is the most important slide. You, if, you, if you have any problem understanding this slide, it, it's, it's time to stop and we go over it again. Okay? Everybody understands this? Good? Fine. Now, we have moved to RPN outside of, of the node hierarchy, but what about value? What about value? Uh, in the beginning of my talk, I said that uh, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, sort of a natural way of uh, representing an, an arithmetic AS3 and evaluate it. So uh, nobody seemed annoyed that I put a value virtual function inside inside a node class and, and its subclasses. But uh, we should think twice because um, value, it seems to suggest that we are using our AST as part of an interpreter. But what if we wanted to use it as part of a compiler as well? In that case, the value virtual function would be of no use to us. And we would, we would be back, you know, to the banana and the gorilla and, and the jungle, right? So uh, really, an, an AST subsystem should only concern itself with representing the AST. And do that well, but don't do anything more. So I surmise that uh, it would be a good idea to move value out of, um, out of the, the class hierarchy. So who thinks that uh, it would be a good idea to move value out of node? Ah, uh, yes. So, okay, tell us. Why this, when this and when that? Mm -hmm. Compiler needs, or needs exactly this. But. It's more for context for like yeah, context for cross propagation generally happens much later. Yeah. Well, it depends on when you when you want to do it. But yeah. Well, uh, the the comment is that uh, it wouldn't play ball with uh, context, right? Uh, context, for, yeah. Well, if you had something like that in your language. But, so the thing is that. Value is likely commonly enough needed in enough circumstances that putting it in the class directly is probably reasonable. Um, okay, so I can also see taking it out. Okay, so the comment is that uh, it, it seems to be such a basic operation that we might as well leave it inside the node hierarchy. Uh, yes, but mm, keep in mind that uh, this is a, a toy, right? Um, I'm not arguing uh, that uh, virtual functions are always useless, right? They are useful. But when choosing between an open method and a virtual function, what do you think would, uh, would the criteria be? Why, uh, if, if you think back of um, Scott Mayer's algorithm, uh, one of the reasons why you should prefer a member function to a free function is if you need access to the object's private parts, right? Now, if you think about it, it's weird because if you look at your virtual functions, often it can be written in terms of the public interface of the class. Um, but, but you cannot do that because you need to be virtual, right? So it's, it's a slippery slope. You want your function to be polymorphic, so it has to be inside the class and, oh, gets access to the private part. Yes, question? Could there be a case, an extension to your AST, which would break the model where value can even be calculated reasonably for a particular node? So therefore, the virtual function would become a problem. Like, it isn't a good one, but I was thinking of like, well, if you have a sine, cosine, or something like that to your, your mathematics facilities here. Yeah. I think that one still works, but maybe there becomes a point where where value is not practical and virtual. And that might mm. be a reason why you would prefer something like this. I, I don't know that there is one, but I'm just positing that. Because that may be like what you guys are kind of talking about too. I can say that. Well, another thing, to another advantage to the virtual is it has better compiler support for forcing everyone to implement it. Okay, so. If that's what you want, then that's a good thing. If it's not what you want, mm -hmm. then it's a bad thing. So indeed, that, that, that is, uh, so the, the comment is that, uh, well, one com the first comment was, uh, what if uh, um, the value open method is not appropriate for all the, uh, the subtypes in the hierarchy? And the answer to that is that, well, simply hook it to another class. So uh, except for access to private parts, any virtual function can be converted to the equivalent open method. 
the second remark was that um, you can have pure virtual functions, but you cannot have pure open methods. Okay, and, and yes, yes, that is correct. Um, and the reason is that they're open. Uh, at one point, uh, you may have a, sub, uh, a set of, uh, of overrides which does not match certain cases, but then maybe another translation unit, or maybe a shared library which is dynamically loaded is going to provide them, okay? So indeed, that, that's, that's a small drawback of open methods. There is no such thing as pure open methods. Uh, the best you can do is a runtime check. You could here uh, provide a most general specialization, which would take a node and throw an exception. Indeed, we, we, have, we have lost that. Other comments or questions? No? So I'm surprised that by now nobody has asked me, can you use virtual on more than one argument? And the answer is yes. But when you talk with your friends about, uh, about my library implementing open methods, please say open methods, not, not open multi-methods or multi-methods. Uh, if you look at multiple dispatch on, uh, on Wikipedia, you'll find out that multiple dispatch is rarely needed. Even in languages that support it natively, like uh, Dialand, uh, they've made you know, statistics and uh, most um, multi-methods, well, they, they had uh, something like between five and seven percent of the cases of dynamic dispatch were multiple dispatch. The rest of the time, most of the time, those methods had only one virtual argument. However, However, sometimes you do need multiple dispatch. Oops. So a classical example is uh, matrix arithmetics. If you want to add two matrices, and you know matrices, they come in, in different subtypes. Uh, you have dense matrices, diagonal matrices, di uh, three diagonal, sparse, symmetrical, square, and so on and so forth. If you, if you add two matrices, you really want to take the dynamic type of the two arguments in, in consideration. If you add, if it turns out to be a diagonal matrix plus a diagonal matrix, first, you want to only add the diagonals. The diagonal matrix subclass is going to store only the diagonal. So when you perform diagonal matrix addition, you only need to add the diagonals. But even more importantly, you want to return a diagonal matrix. Otherwise, if you add two diagonal matrices and you, you, know, you just return a dense matrix, it will be a waste. It will be a dense matrix made of mostly zero, except on the diagonal, right? So this is the classical case of um, multiple dispatch. However, uh, sometimes there are, are situations when, uh, when you may want to dispatch on more than two types. Uh, I've been told that uh, it, it often happens in, uh, in adventure games. Uh, many, ad many adventure games are written in a language called TADS, T-A-D-S, probably text adventure design system or whatnot. And it comes natively with, with multi-methods to handle cases like this. Uh, if, you, if you're a human and uh, you want to fight a creature with an ax, you're not agile enough to will because, uh, because you're not a warrior. But if you're a warrior, you want to fight a creature with an axe, you chop the creature into pieces. Except if it's a dragon, then you get roasted. But if you're a human and you try to fight a, to fight a dragon with your bare hands, well, it's wonderful you just kill a dragon with your bare hands. Does it ring a bell to anyone? So there was an adventure game uh, back in, uh, in the 90s where uh, you know you were moving in a, in a maze and uh, you had you know your kit with uh, axes and spells and so on and you encountered creatures and i got stuck for like uh, one week in a room with a dragon i tried everything cast a spell you're not you're not a wizard not not agile enough to wield 
uh, I tried with the, I tried everything, and it kept asking me. Uh, uh, what was the question again? It, it, it asked me, uh, "Do you want to kill it? Uh, do, you, do you want to kill it with your bare hands?" And after one week, I typed yes, and it replied, "You just kill a dragon with your bare hands." Okay. So sometimes it is useful to dispatch on more than two arguments. Now, uh, I, I don't have slides on how to implement this um, with other techniques, of, of course. In the first case, you could use visitor again, or all, all the tricks that we, we, we saw before. You, can, you, you, you could use nested type switches. Uh, you could use double dispatch and have fun implementing triple dispatch properly. So sometimes it is useful. And how do you get that? Well, it's very easy. You add the virtual specifier to more than one virtual argument. You can put them wherever you want, and of course, you can also add non-virtual arguments. Right? Questions, remarks? And which specialization is selected? Well, actually, I don't need to make you know, a big sentence. You already know the rules. It's exactly the same thing that happens with uh, function overloading or partial template spe spe specialization. So given the dynamic type of all the virtual arguments, the system finds the most specialized. But sometimes there is no function available at all. Or, but sometimes there are several candidates which are some of them are more specialized on one of the virtual arguments, and some of them are more specialized on the other. In that case, it's an ambiguity, exactly like what we, what we get, we can get with fun function overloading. In that case, we have to add a new overrider which shadows the ambiguity. Okay. Now, in um, when you use open methods, there's no there's no this. Uh, it's, it's just one of the arguments, and uh, sometimes, you know, when you provide implementations of a virtual function at several levels of, of your hierarchy, in that case, typically, you want to call the super, uh, the, the, the super method, the, the virtual function in, in the immediate base class. Because if you don't do that, it means that you're canceling behavior, which is probably a sign of a, of a problem with your design. Um, in a world of open methods, uh, it's called next. So here, if I have uh, a, a method uh, which uh, takes a dog and uh, it kicks the dog and it returns a string which is bark, but if the dog is a bulldog, it, it barks and it bites back, right? So here in this specialization, which, which overrides this specialization if it's indeed a bulldog, we call next dog. And next dog calls the method which would have been called if the current method didn't exist. In the world of virtual functions, it amounts to saying, OK, I've done the, bu the, the bulldog part. Now I call the equivalent for dog. But in presence of, vir of multiple virtual arguments, and this is an example from, from Dylan. Um, it's, it's a bit more uh, complicated. So here we have a method inspect, which takes a vehicle and an inspector. And it, it says, uh, you know, it says it's OK, it's not OK. And then we have a method called inspect, which takes a car, which is a vehicle, and an inspector. And a method which is called inspect, which takes a car, which is a vehicle, and a state inspector, which is an inspector. Right. If here you call this method passing it a car and a state inspector, it does its processing, but first it calls next, and it's going to arrive here. Then it calls next, it, 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 it lands here. Okay? So next is how you do super in presence of uh, any number of virtual arguments. OK, questions or remarks here? No? Uh, 35 minutes. Now, so now, um, when you program with, with open methods, is it object-oriented programming? In a sense, yes, because I'm using uh, inheritance. 
and polymorphism. But uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, a function like fight in the adventure example. It doesn't belong to any of uh, the, the three hierarchies, right? So I'm not forced to constrain all the behavior inside classes. Now, let's talk a bit about the, the history of object-oriented object programming. It started with Simula 60. It was a derivative of Algol, which was the first language to implement virtual functions. And then they, they realized that they had some, something, you know, something new, and they moved all the simulation parts of Simula. Simula was a language for simulation. They put it in a library, and they called the resulting language, when, which had nothing to do with, the, with uh, simulation. Stupidly, they called it Simula 68. So, of course, everybody said, oh, Simula 68, I don't do simulation. So I'm not interested, right? And uh, OOP stayed you know, in, in limbo for a while until a small talk was created. And small talk came with a very compelling metaphor, which, which made it very easy to teach. The metaphor is that the world is a collection of objects which talk to each other via messages, and each object reacts to messages according to its nature. So it's a, it's a very good metaphor. But the problem is that it forces us to think in terms of, of, of objects. That is, that is what OOP really is. It's not, it's not simply about encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. It, it's a way of viewing the world. And that is probably what is wrong with, with OOP. Uh, in around 85, the Lisp community created an object system which was not based on that metaphor of objects talking to each other. Instead, it saw methods more like rules. Given a, given a series of objects, I apply the most specific rule. And in that worldview, algorithms take the front stage again. So in my opinion, programming with open methods is, is not really object-oriented programming, because it doesn't focus so obsessively on objects and classes. Commands. Uh, OK, let's get more technical. So how does it work? Because I want you to understand how it works so that you're convinced that it's actually usable. So first, it's, it's a library written entirely in, stan uh, in standard C++ 17. So there's no need to run preprocessors, post linkers, and the like. Uh, method dispatch is in constant time. Well, more accurately, proportional to the number of virtual arguments. Uh, just like virtual function, it, it fun functions, it uses tables of function pointers. Now, I guess that we all know that how virtual functions are implemented. Inside an object, uh, there is a pointer to the virtual function table, and that's how it works, right? So, uh, how, how, do I, how do I match? Okay, obviously I have tables of data which I'm going to show you, which I use to dispatch a call. But given an object, how do I find the, the relevant table? Uh, so in a previous iteration of my library, uh, the objects were required to collaborate. You, you had to instrument the classes. Or you had to, you had to use or it used the type ID in a way that was, that was very slow. Well, here, the trick is that um, if I have an object which has to be polymorphic, I'm going to use the address of the object's type info. And if you read the standard that in a program, it is strongly recommended that there's only one type info object for any given type. But occasionally, it seems that there can be several, and my system also supports it. But the idea is that um, I, um, I extract the type ID of, of the object, I take its address, and I, I use a perfect integer hash, which is a hash function that doesn't have collisions. 
Yes, it exists. Uh, the problem is that they're hard to find, but we'll get to this. In this part of the talk, I'm going to use another class hierarchy, which is a little more realistic. Uh, it's a payroll application. So we have two hierarchies, role, subclass, employee. Role is, a, is an abstract class. Uh, employee is a concrete subclass of role, and manager is a concrete subclass of employee. And then we have founder, which is not an employee, but it still derives from role. And then we have expense, which I denote X when I need to abbreviate. Subclasses of expense are cab and private jet. And we have a abstract public transportation class which derives from expense, which has two concrete subclasses, bus and train, right? And we're going to examine a first, what I call a uni method, which is a, a, an open method with one virtual argument. And that method is called pay. It takes a virtual employee, uh, note, not a role, right? Here we hook the pay method to the people who can be paid, that is, employees and a subset of employees which are managers, right? Um, and then we define two specializations, uh, one for a pay employee, and we have an override for managers, where once again we call next and we add, I don't know, bonus or something. Um, it, it, it is not uh, dollars in New York City. It could be. It could be euros. Do you want to work for that company? Okay. And I'll have an approve multi-method, which says that uh, given a an expense uh, posted by a role for a reason for and for an amount, is it approved or not? So by default here, we, we define a specialization which is a sort of catch-all specialization. In general, we say no, it's not approved. But if it's an employee and it's public transfer, transportation, we say yes, it's okay. If it's a manager, manager can also take cabs. So it should be cab here. And if it's the founder, it's always true, right? If it's a founder, whatever the expense, it's true. Okay? Very realistic, right? So, let's look at what the, the macros do first. Declare method is going to uh, expand to, to this. It uses, you know, preprocessor tricks, which were actually, uh, uh, David here showed me that you can do more than what I thought you can do with the preprocessor. And it generates uh, in an anonymous namespace, a namespace with a unique name, it's based on counter, and uh, behind each method there is an, inst uh, an instance of a template class called method, which takes the return type, which takes a tag, here you see I declare a struct yum2 method pay, and I just declare it, no, I don't define it. Uh, it's used as a tag, and there's the list of uh, the, the function parameters, and this we, we don't talk about it, policy. And a static constructor that registers the method in the system. And that macro also creates two functions. One which is called pay, which has the same argument list minus the virtual with one parameter added in front, which is called discriminator. I have, you know, removed uh, yum2 detail, blah, 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 to make it more readable. And then this is the entry point of the method. It's, a, it's an ordinary inline function that takes an employee, again, without a virtual qualifier, which locates a function, and we're going to look into this, and calls the function. Right? So it means that you can, you can overload pay. You can have several methods called pay, and if they're sufficiently different, you'll have no problem. 
Now, define method. Again, it's a macro which uh, creates, a, which hides things in, uh, in nested namespaces. And now the problem we have is that um, how, does the de how does the defined method locate the method to specialize? Because, you know, when, when we multiply matrices, we, we, we probably have several multiply methods. One that multiplies a matrix and a matrix, one that multiplies a double and a matrix, and one that multiplies a matrix and a double. So how does YUM2 match a specialization, a defined method, with the appropriate declaration, right? Well, it, it uses that, um, this function here. It uses this construct, construct to pretend to call the pay function with the extra argument, and that extra function returns returns the the method. Uh, it's uh, one slide before. It returns this, and this you don't really instantiate it. it it's just a bunch of uh, of, of static variables. So that's, that's how it finds the method to, to overload. And, and then, and then it, it, it contains a static constructor which registers the specialization to the method. Uh, I'll skip next. And then, then this is actually the code here. It closes the two namespaces and it starts the uh, declaration of the function. And then this comes here, right? So that, that's how it works at compile time. Before you call any function, any method, main has to call update methods. Update methods is going to do a lot of things. Uh, it processes the, all the data store created by the static constructor, so declare class, declare method, define method. It builds a representation of all that. Um, and then it, it calculates the, um, the dispatch tables, which are used for multi methods. And at the end, it, it puts everything in a single vector, and that's for, for locality. And it finds the perfect hash function. And the perfect hash function is, is very simple. X is the address of type ID, of type info. And the hash function has the form m times x shifted by s. It may not be the best hash function, but I don't care. What I want is that it's fast. And the problem is, how do I find m and s? So if I have, yes? So, uh, what made you think that uh, perfect hash function existed with that form? OK, the question is, what makes me think that that perfect hash function existed in that form? Uh, I did some reading uh, on, a, on a perfect hash functions. Um, this hash function is perfect, but it is not minimal. Uh, because it is possible to map a set of arbitrary integers, of n arbitrary integers, to the range 0 to n. That, that is not it. Those, those exist, but they're very hard to find, and, and the shape of the hash function is more complicated. It contains an if. I don't want an if. What I want is just uh, fetch, fetch the, uh, the address of the type info, which is just before the first virtual function in the virtual function table, and multiply, shift. I don't even want to do an end. And then I have it. I have my, my hash. Yes, question? So about how dense does it end up being? How dense? Well, it depends. Uh, so. Um, how do I find M and S? It's actually very stupid. I use a random search. So if I have 17 uh, the, the virtual functions, well, if I have 17 classes which are concerned with methods, right? Uh, so I have 17 virtual, uh, 17 addresses to hash, and I, I simply start with a, a target hash table of size, 
of 32, the next power. And then, I, then um, so that gives me the value of s, right? The value of s is, is in fact, 64 minus, in this case, 5. And, and I try a few thousand times to, to find an m. OK, I, I draw an m at random. And I apply the hash function to each of the, the, the pointers I have. And if I find a collision, then I try again. And it works surprisingly, surprisingly well. Uh, usually, uh, the, the density is around uh, 3 fourths. I don't really care about uh, the, the wasted space. Um, and uh, I, I did, uh, I did uh, try it with large, hi large hierarchies. Like I tried it with um, uh, a translation of the small talk three class library hierarchy. hierarchy. So, so if you have a density out of three fourths, that, that means that if you're going to the next power of two, that means you usually find it in the first attempt. Yes, and if I don't find it after a certain number of attempts, which is configurable, then I just double. Yes. Yes. Uh, now I'm, I have 18 minutes, so I, I'll go ahead, and if we have time, we can discuss this further. But it's a, it's a really nice trick. It, of course, the, the only reason why I can afford to do this is that uh, update method is, is called once, or each, or each time that you load or unload a, uh, a dynamic object, uh, a shared object. Uh, but OK, it, it, it takes some time, and I even have solutions to that. But it, it, it works very well. But it's only because I know beforehand uh, I have a closed set of values to hash. But it, it's a nice trick that you may find uh, uh, relevant to some time. So let's look at the dispatch, uh, what happens when I call um, a uni method like pay. What happens is, is very much like virtual member functions. Uh, so employee and manager have an associated table, which has a certain number of slots. And, in, and pay occupies one slot in that M table. OK, V table, for methods I call them M table. So pay occupies one slot. And then that slot, in the case of a uni method, it simply contains the pointer to the function to call. So here it is. During update methods, OK, this is pseudo C++, but that, that's essentially what happens. Um, the method object, it has more arguments, but we ignore them, contains a static variable, which is called slot strides, which is of type word. And a word is a union that can be either a pointer to a word or an, int or an integer, or a pointer to a function. In this case, in my example, it, it happens, and I'll give you a glimpse, it happens that uh, the slot number one has been picked for the pay uni method. So here we have slot strides dot i equal one. Uh, we have a global mtbls table, which is the table that contains the pointer to, uh, to the to, to the M table for, for each type. This is where we use uh, the, the perfect hash. So we extract the type ID from employee, which is also the same value that later when I have an object in hand, I will find inside the object, right? So here I'm initializing my table. I find the index. In the index, well, here, um, it, the, the slot zero is used by approve. But here uh, for, uh, for pay, uh, we have a pointer to the function pay employee, or rather a wrapper, because sometimes we need to do static cast, sometimes dynamic cast. Uh, imagine that, um, I don't know, uh, that role were a virtual base of, uh, uh, of, uh, of its subclasses. So sometimes we need to do some adjustments. But this is how the, the, the data, the global data is, is initialized by update methods for method pay and classes employee and manager.
And when we call it, when we call pay employee, which can be also be a manager, right? What happens is simply this. Uh, sorry, a little bug here. It should be employee, employee. We ask the type ID of employee, takes its address, and that is very fast. It's read the VPTR and read the word which is just before the beginning of the VPTR. So here, at this point, we have found the M table for either employee or manager. Now we need to we read the value which is uh, at the position allocated to pay, and there it is. We we have the function we need to call, so we call employee. We call the function. Right, so it's very simple. And the code that is generated is, 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 is very good with modern compilers. So if you compile with NDebug and O2, even though I'm, I'm not even sure that O2 would be necessary here, here is the generated code. Fetch the address of the hash table, the shift factor, the slot, in this case one. This reads the VPTR and this reads the pointer to the type info. Multiply, shift, and here we're ready to index and find the pointer to, to the right function, okay? Questions or comments? Yes. You wonder if compar uh, the comparison? What would it look like uh, if you were just using inheritance ritual, ritual function? Oh, okay. Um, I actually have it here, and it, it, it's an interesting direction, uh, discussion to have. Um, and we have 12 minutes. So virtual function calls are very efficient in C++. Here, it depends on your instruction set, but here, it just um, reads the VPTR uh, and, and jumps. Well, the function I'm, I'm showing here, it's a simple pass-through, right? Uh, it, gets, it, doesn't, it, it gets its, its arguments from outside, passes them to, uh, to the virtual function or to the method. And it returns the value that the virtual function or the method returns. So in that case, there is a small optimization. There's no need to return to, to this function. So, but this is a, so this is, this is very good. And, and what, what really helps virtual function is that 16, the offset of uh, the virtual function in the V table is known at compile time. That being said, this is still very fast. It, it surprised me that uh, this runs uh, about only 15% slower than a virtual function call. Uh, it still sort of puzzles me. Um, you know, it, it's difficult to benchmark things such as virtual functions. Even if you make sure that the call is not elided, uh, it, it's not something easy to benchmark. So. Um, what I do here uh, with this function, it's actually, um, it's actually a bit unfair when you compare to virtual functions, because usually, you know, you have to push arguments onto the stack. Usually, you have to return to the calling function. You cannot simply jump and do that optimization. So I'm, I'm actually being quite um, uh, unfair to, to methods here. However, I, I'm still surprised that it, it, it runs so fast. So um, I can see at least two reasons for that. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in, uh, in machine code anymore, but uh, I think that uh, the way the instructions are arranged make it possible to run two or three of them at, at the same time. See here, RAX is used only much later. So I think that this move can be executed in parallel with, with this instruction. That's one of my theories. Also, uh, since we're in a loop, uh, all those values end up in the L1 cache. 
But it's also the case for virtual functions. So that, that, that's why I say that it's difficult to compare. Uh, but OK, a 15% slowdown is good. I cannot swear that in a real situation it would be 15%. But from looking at the instructions, you understand that if the body of your method does any work at all, this is going to be unnoticeable. So that is my message. Um, YUM2 is not one of those toy libraries that use, you know, oh, we just use an, ord an, ordered, an, an ordered map. And uh, each time we see a new type tuplet, uh, a type tuple, then, then we stop and we start thinking which uh, specialization should be used. And we update our map and finally we call code. And that, that makes those systems unusable. You never know how much uh, a method call is going to cost you except that even in the most favorable case, it's going to be very slow. So this is on par in terms of, of speed with virtual functions. Uh, questions or remarks? Uh, dispatching a multi-method is a little more complicated. You have to use a multi-dimensional dispatch table, and uh, one of the problems is that the size can grow very quickly. Uh, if you're not careful, uh, if the first virtual argument has, uh, you know, uh, can, um, can involve 10 different subclasses, and the second virtual argument can involve 20 different classes, uh, you have a, a 200 cell table. And if you have a third virtual argument, like in, in the adventure uh, example, and you know, you can see that it can grow very quickly, except that uh, in most cases, if you, would, if you were to write that table explicitly, you would notice that there are a lot of redundancies in that table, that there are many identical rows or columns. Uh, and you could think, oh, I'm going to compress it. And that is what, what YUM2 YUM2 does except that it, it doesn't compress the table. It wouldn't, it wouldn't help because maybe you can, you can have a two gigabyte table which can be compressed to a very small table but you still don't have the memory to process it, right? So the tables are, are built devoid of redundancies right off the bat. And it means that um, they are built in terms not of classes but in groups and it, it's easier to see on this slide. So remember my approve example? We indeed have one row per role subclass, but we can use the same column for the for expense, the abstract expense class and private jet. Same thing for public bus and train. They can all use the same column. And you know it makes sense because uh, if you remember the set of overloads that I presented, if you are a lowly employee and the expense is public, then approve yes. I never specialize on, on bus and train, right? So that is the reason why those three classes, public, bus, and train, can all share the same column, okay? Any questions? Yes? Does it work with operators, like operator class or operator something? Can I override the operators? Um, uh, so the question is, um, can, I, uh, can I make an operator an open method, right? Um, it, would, it wouldn't work with all the you know, macro trickery. So in that case, what you do, you'd simply declare a method which could which you would call add, and then inline matrix or share partner matrix or whatever, operator plus A, B, and then you would call the method. Other questions? Now, equipped with this table, we can dispatch. We can examine the dispatch of a multi method. So here it's a bit more complicated. Um, this time, slot stride is, contains a vector of words. 
Well, actually, not really a vector because they are all stored in a global vector, but it doesn't matter. And the, the meaning of those, four num uh, those three numbers here, zero means that for its first virtual argument role, a proof occupies slot zero of the method table associated to that role subtype, that role or role subtype. Four is a stride. At one point, we're going to have to index this table and we, we need to know how many rows uh, there are so that we can, you know, do the indexation in presence of uh, two, three, four dimensions. And zero is, once again, the slot that is occupied by a proof second virtual argument in the method tables in the expense hierarchy. Now, uh, there are some optimizations. Um, so MTBLS the, of hash of type ID employee. So, right, this is the method table for employee, okay? We know that the second slot is used by pay and the first slot contains a pointer inside this table. Okay, so we, 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 can, we can already pre-compute the first indexation. If it's a manager, it will contain a pointer to this cell. Same thing for manager, and now uh, for the expense hierarchy, this is the M table. It has only one element. Why? Well, because pay doesn't have a role virtual argument. In my example, we have three virtual arguments, one for pay and two for role. Uh, sorry, one for pay and two for approve. The virtual argument of pay is employee, and the virtual arguments of, um, of uh, approve are role and, and expense. So in the expense hierarchy, the method tables have only one entry, which is used only by approve. And this is simply the index, the number of the column to be used for the second virtual argument. Okay, it takes a bit of time to really understand uh, all, those, uh, all those tables, and uh, so I'm running a bit out of time now. Uh, what does a call to the approve method uh, look like? Um, we fetch the method table for the role. Slot tries, this is, the, this is zero. This is the, the slot used by approve in the, uh, in the role hierarchy. So here at this point we have a pointer to a cell in the dispatch table. And then we extract a uh, the M table for uh, expense. And here we read the column index, which, is, which, is, um, which depends on the dynamic type, and we multiply it by the stride, which is four in this case. And all this indexes this pointer here, and finally we have our function pointer, right? Uh, Here's the performance summary. Uh, I, I, I benchmark with GCC6 and Clang6. Uh, the performance of a, one of a uni method against a virtual function call, it's 16, 17%. You know, it fluctuates. I also benchmark uh, the double dispatch against a, 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 a multi method with two virtual arguments. And here, 25% uh, slower with uh, open methods with GCC. Clang is, a, is, a, is not as good. 
In the case of virtual inheritance, uh, what if, for example, um, uh, private jet virtually derives from role? In that case, YOM2 builds a wrapper that uses a dynamic cast to downcast to adjust the type and the address of, uh, of the arguments. Uh, well, it's still, uh, it's still okay. This, this one is, uh, is a little annoying here. Here, clients, it's a bit. Uh, okay, I'm over time, but since, since many of you arrived late, do you mind if I speak five more minutes? Okay. So there are other open method systems uh, out there. And the most uh, notable is, uh, is the work of uh, two of uh, Strasbourg students, uh, Peter Pirkelbauer and Yuri Solotki. Um, but really the important guy in those three is Yuri Solotki. He, he wrote uh, very interesting papers on uh, open methods, open pattern matching, open type switches. Uh, there's my previous library, YUM11. And then there's CMM and, and Loki and, and other systems. I'm not going to, to, to talk about them because I don't know them so well and I don't want to you know, say something which would be unfair. Anyway, they don't seem to be very, very used anymore at this point. So <coughs> the uh, Yuri Solodki, nicknamed Solodon on GitHub, uh, his, uh, his, um, his papers were uh, at one point uh, almost um, proposed to the standard committee uh, around 2007, I think, uh, and I tried to model uh, YUM2 to, uh, to that uh, proposal. However, there are differences. Uh, but is anyone familiar with uh, the, multi, the open multi method proposal? You are? You interested in this? Uh, in open multi methods? Say again? In open multi methods? Uh, no, in, in how YUM2 compares with uh, the, uh, yeah. the proposal. Okay, so I'll get back to it. Well, no. Okay, we, we can conclude on this. Uh, in, let, let, let's call it in, a, in solid key system, right? In solid key system, one override can actually override two base methods. Uh, it took me a while to realize that it is possible, but yes, it can. Uh, YUM2 doesn't, doesn't allow this. Um, what? No, 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 this is wrong, this is wrong. YUM2 overrides are not available for overloading. Oh, yes, yes, right. Um, in a solid key system, an override is also is, is visible as an ordinary function. So uh, you, can, you can actually uh, call an, 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 an override as if it were an, an overloaded function. I don't have much time anymore, but uh, that I couldn't implement. Um, so lot key system at attempts harder to resolve ambiguities. Uh, in case of ambiguity, it's going to look at the return type, at the covariant return time to try to lift the ambiguity. I disagree with this. I think that it, it would just make, I prefer to get an exception if there's an ambiguity because it's too subtle. It, it's not predictable enough. So I disagree with this. I could implement this. YUM2 supports smart pointers. So if you read Solotki's papers, he says that, oh, shared pointer, it's not a polymorphic type. Shared pointer of T, T may be a polymorphic type, but the shared pointer itself is not. It's, it's, it's a value type. Um, I, I disagree with this. I, I think that it's absolutely impractical that if you cannot write an add method that takes a shared pointer to a matrix and, and, and so on. And uh, YUM2 has a concept of next. I was surprised during email exchanges with uh, Yuri Solotki that he didn't even know what next is. Uh, in his system, you have to, ex when, when you are in, in a method, you have to explicitly specify what method to call next. I think that kind of goes back to 
we don't allow specializing multiple methods of an override. Yes. Because if you have multiple ways you can go next, the next one is problematic. Okay, the, the comment is that uh, the reason why uh, SolidKey doesn't support next is that it's because the same override is allowed to override two different methods. And in that case, what next would we use? Uh, well, I think that it can be made to work. Um, it's just that uh, the method mechanism should pass the pointer to next in the argument list. So yes, it could work. So that's not the reason. Other remarks or comments? So I guess that nobody used YUM11 before, so there's no point in going over those slides. Uh, links here. And uh, uh, final poll, uh, um, have I con whom, whom have I convinced? Oh, wow, I expected zero. Uh, easier now. Um, have I planted uh, the seed of doubt in anyone else's head? If yes, raise your hand. Oh, that's depressing. Sorry. Usually it's the other way around. Okay, well, uh, it's, it's quite an uh, unfamiliar idea in the world of C++. Well, so to be clear, yes? I came to the talk because I wanted to see the multi-methodness and the other things, because obviously you can't easily just search up functions and so forth. So, and so you didn't really have to convince me that that was necessary, so, or that that might be something that would be interesting to be able to do. Um, and I actually have a question. So obviously uh, the standards committee is looking at reflection uh, facilities, mm -hmm. which would allow you to see things like maybe the method names and so forth. Um, have you looked at all at what the proposals are there and whether or not you could utilize that to improve the machine room this year? So the first, your comment was that I haven't convinced you of the utility of multi-methods? No, I was, I was convinced that that was a, a reasonable thing to do uh -huh. before I came, so you didn't have to. Oh, right, you were already convinced. Okay, uh, thank you. However, I insist that on, on the fact that multi-methods are nice to have. Occasionally you need multiple dispatch, but most of the time you don't. So I insist the, the strong point of YUM2 is the open part, right? Less convinced. <laughs> Less convinced, okay, well. And, and then you had a, a question which was... So the, the standard committee is working... Oh yeah, on reflection. So the standard committee is working on uh, several reflection proposals. Uh, am I aware of them? And I guess that um, the subtext is, do I think that it could help implementing this sort of library? Um, well, I'm not actively following the committee. I am aware of some of the proposals. Like uh, I went to uh, Louis Dion's talk yesterday where he presented a sort of Lisp-like syntax for generating code. Um, I'm not sure, it depends uh, how far it will go. So this library also exists in, in the D language. And uh, D has a, a much more powerful compile time introspection system and uh, a better ref uh, runtime reflection system as well. And in D, you don't need to register the classes. You don't need to use macros and so on. Uh, it, it uses uh, compile time metaprogramming to scan an entire module and, and you know, find things. Uh, it does require you to, to add an attribute on method uh, definitions. And actually, it's not even necessary. It's just, you know, it's, it's the equivalent of override to catch mistakes. Uh, will C++ ever reach the uh, power of uh, these metaprogramming capabilities? Uh, I, I doubt it, or I'm not sure it'll still be alive. Um, there are certainly, uh, so I could show you later the macros that I used, uh, which use boost pp, uh, you know, to, to generate uh, those uh, function declarations and, yeah. Um, no, I was not going to show the macros, but you can see that when you say uh, declare method, 
I create two functions, one which is just a function declaration, the discriminator, and another, another one which you know, just calls the thing. Uh, certainly, if I, if I could use uh, code generation and so on, I would ditch those macros. Right. Right. So yes, I would use it. So I guess this is one of those things um, where it seems like you know, this kind of capability should inform the use cases for the standard committee. And, and you, the, the exact case you said there where, oh, I need to be able to find all the classes in a module. That might be something yes. people wouldn't think of. Yes, as yes. As a required, or I need to find all the classes in the hierarchy, which of course is complicated. But, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I think that uh, if, if you're going to design that sort of facilities, you, you need, you know, uh, really hard use cases, so that at, at least when you're done, uh, you can do pretty much anything you want. Uh, uh, I have some contacts with uh, the people who are involved in, uh, in the standard committee, but my impression is that these days anything which is runtime or polymorphic is not very popular. And it's, uh, it's not always easy to get them interested in in this use case. Okay, great. Other, That's a good point to wrap up the session as well. Uh, say again, please? Maybe we should wrap up the session now. Uh, yeah, the comment was that uh, I should shut up now. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, thank you for attending. <laughs>